What's up, party people? In the place to be is Talib Kweli. You are now back in the house with the world's best podcast, The People's Party. Because we are the world's best podcast, we have the best guest. We have the best co-host. Give it up to my co-host, Jasmine Lee. Woo, that's me. <laughs> Jasmine, I see you are raising the roof instead of clapping your hands. What's the deal with that? Yes, because my hands are freaking swollen, so I have to go back to the 90s and raise the roof. <laughs> well, that's interesting because today's guest dropped her debut album in the 1990s. And uh, she's also a mother, so maybe she can give you some advice on being pregnant. Um, today's guest is a straight-up godmother of the hip-hop ecosystem. She is also my sister. She has worked with the greats, dropped hits, put in the time. She's collaborated with legends like Prince, Queen Latifah, Whitney Houston. She's an integral part of my favorite hip-hop crew, the Native Tongues. Her debut album, Down to Earth, it came out at a time when female rappers had to fight for any sort of attention and traction in the industry. Tracks like It's a Shame, uh, Money in the Middle, really the whole album. It took an unapologetic feminist slash womanist stance in an era where rap was a, largely about male bravado, toxic masculinity, but putting that to the side for a second. She's also a prominent radio DJ and radio host. She's uh, worked all over the country, but right now you can hear her on KISS 104.1 in Atlanta. She has a very excellent show. She continues to advocate for women, particularly black women. She continues to advocate for the culture. I just did a show out here in Ohio where there were a lot of famous people on stage. I'm talking about some of those most famous artists and comedians in the world. And when this woman took the stage, people fanned out. I seen like grown men turn into real, real, real stands. Oh. This is a legend of the culture, undeniable. I'm very lucky to call this person my friend. People, give it up to Moni Love and the place to be. Yeah. Wow, that was that was awesome. That was an awesome <laughs> like intro. Like, that was I love it. That's you, Moni. That's who you Thanks are. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming <laughs> to hang out with us in Ohio. Oh man, for sure. I wouldn't have it was this it was my birthday. It was my 50th birthday. And this was ah, 50. This Happy is how birthday. I I'm 50. <laughs> yes. Wow. Black don't crack. This is what 50 year old look like in hip hop. You know. Um now <laughs> <laughs> you were born in London. And yes. is your is your dad a Rastafarian? Yes. How much yes. did his beliefs and connection to Rastafarianism um influence you as a child? I was heavily influenced by my father's uh, faith, his, 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 his level of meditation, mm -hmm. um, his, his vibes, his chillness, it, and, and flowing into the type of music that he listened to. The, my home was very moody in terms of, you know, a Saturday mood. I knew what that was. I knew what it sounded like musically. A Sunday mood. I knew what that sounded like musically. It, it every day took on a different musical uh, uh, background soundtrack, if you may. Mm -hmm. And this is all due to my father's level of meditational process and mm -hmm. coming from Rastafarianism and, and his chi, I guess mm -hmm. you would call it. Okay. So very heavily influenced by him. Okay. Now, um, in London, you and I have talked about how the dance came before the rapping for hip hop. You started out as a B girl. You said spinning on your back, right? Ooh. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because you, you still that's got how moves. we got it. You still got moves? Oh no, no, no. I'm not none you got of those all the fresh floor, moves? none of those on the floor moves. No. I can still <laughs> I can I can still up rock. I still top rock. You know what I'm saying? I'll still eat somebody's food as far as all of that's concerned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and Crazy Legs will tell you too. He can attest to that. But the de the on the floor stuff, yeah, I'm mm. not doing that. You know, my knees can't take that stuff anymore. I don't have four kids. My back can't do that anymore. Like, yeah, no, I'm staying away from those moves. Shout no out Megan to Crazy Legs. Knees. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I'm I'm staying away from those. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what was it like coming up in the 80s, um, sort of under the mentorship of the Cookie Crew? A lot of people forget about the influence of female rappers, Cookie Crew, from the UK. 
Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, many people, even a lot of people in England, they'll, they'll today, they'll think like, oh, you know, our girl that made it from the UK was Moni Love and she went out and she earned the respect of the hip hop community and so on and so forth. And it's like, I have to remind people, I was um, Cookie Crew's little sister. Mm. Cookie Crew was first mm. as far as put, put, especially putting women in the UK on the, on the map as MCs. They were first. Cookie Crew was first and they ushered me in as their little sister. And I learned a lot from them because uh, being around them all the time on their stage shows as hip hop was growing in the United Kingdom, um, Cookie Crew were the, the, the fourth, they were at the forefront of the movement. So a lot of what I learned as far as stage play, as far as stage presence, as far as just the level of professionalism as uh, an artist showing up, sound check, mm -hmm. these things. A lot of those things early I learned from the Cookie Crew because they okay. were first. Mm. Word. You were born and raised in London in the 70s and 80s, and um, that was the punk's golden age, the Buzzcocks era. era sorry, the Buzzcocks era. Uh, did you sense really early on that hip hop was going to be important enough for you to dedicate your life to? No, I had no clue. In England, um, growing up in England, um, the black music that we gravitate to uh, come from our origins. So the large majority of, of black people in the UK are either straight up from Ghana or Nigeria mm -hmm. um, or any of the islands in the West Indies. So it's, you know, Grenadian, uh, Trinidadians, Jamaicans, you know, St. Lucians, um, mm. Barbadians, any of these islands because they're all under the British Commonwealth because, um, you know, the empire, the, the, the sun would never set upon the British Empire, right. basically meaning that their empire was so vast that it was always daytime somewhere in the British Empire. OK. And so among those places that was part of their Commonwealth were these West Indian islands. And in the 40s after World War Two, um, Britain's economy needed to be rebuilt. They needed uh, an influx of manpower to uh, work in the coal mines and um, drive the transportation and work in uh, the national health system. So all of th this influx of people from the different islands that were under the rule of the British Commonwealth were brought in to the UK. My grandfather among them and a lot of parents settled into what they needed to do got their living spaces, and then started sending for their children. And a lot of those families had children that were older already. My grandparents had 10 kids. Some of them were adults already. There was uh, five of them that were adults already, and then there were five that were younger. My mother was among the younger set, so she's one of the kids that got sent for, bringing her to the UK. Same thing with my father's side of the family. So my parents met in the UK, mm -hmm. married in the UK, had their children, myself, and my brother in the UK. So the music that we grew up listening to came from our folks. Mm -hmm. I grew up listening, you know, I don't call Bob Marley, Bob Marley. I say Bob, like he's my uncle for real. Mm. And, and, and that's a general vibe that a lot of um, uh, kids from West Indian backgrounds, especially Jamaican backgrounds have. He's Bob. Mm -hmm. He's like the Jamaican patron saint, you know? So that was flooded through the household at all times on any given day. Um, my father, so we, we gravitate towards that. We gravitate towards the sound systems and, and, and sound system culture. Mm -hmm. Again, coming from, you know, Jamaica, a lot of the, uh, Trinidadians and uh, Barbadians and stuff, big soca influence, soca and Calypso. These are the things that we were listening to in England growing up. And of course, being kids born in Britain, we also gravitated to a lot of what was going on from Britain. Mm -hmm, you know, right. so we, we, the police, um, Dexy's Midnight Runners. Um, I mean, I'm sure I, I might be mentioning some names and say, you know, Ultravox. I might be naming some groups that you might not know, but this is the culture of which we were listening to. So we mm -hmm. would w watch this show called Top of the Pops, which was like the number one music show. We didn't see that many black artists on there. Uh, and then they started they started to implement black artists a little bit more as, as I got older, but initially it wasn't really so much, but musically it was all that we had. We had what we grew up with in our households and we had what we watched on the TV. Mm -hmm. So those kind, all of those things kind of allowed me to become rounded 
in in my music appreciation. You know, so I I can go from A E I O U, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. to to I don't want to wait in vain for your love, Bob Marley, in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Did you see the verses with a uh, Beanie Man and Bounty Killer? That was what? my favorite. Okay, okay, that was the best that was one. My f- that was my favorite <laughs> versus battle. It really was. I was mental in my mm-hmm. house. My kids were mental. We was. I was banging on my um my kitchen cabinets. Yeah, because when something I was when something's good. And mm. when something, when you're in a sound clash, it was a right. sound clash. Like it That's was right. really, it was, yeah, it was really true to the nature of, of J- Jamaican sound system. Mm-hmm. It was a sound clash. So every time something came on, cause I had it on the speaker and I was in my kitchen and I was actually cooking while it was on it. Every time something good ca- came on, I went over to my kitchen cabinets and started banging my kitchen cabinets <laughs> yes. because, <laughs> because that's what we right. do. You know what right. I mean? You know what I mean? It was, it was tremendous. The energy was crazy when when the police came and tried right. to shut it. Oh my gosh! And tried to shut it down, and then they couldn't shut it down. It was just so true to traditional sound clash culture mm. that I, I I loved it. And then later on, when I saw the um the verses between uh, Jada and Fabulous, it reminded me. It reminded me of because they were together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were together. They did because that. I think they were they're inspired by Beanie and, and Bounty. And you know what else I like about the Jada Kiss a Fabulous one? They did something that I said to my friends that people should do. But I feel like because Jada Kiss a Fabulous are real MCs like that, we I didn't tell them, but they came up with the same plan where they switched off halfway through because the person who goes mm-hmm. second is always going to have the advantage. So if you mm-hmm. want it to be really fair, you got to switch halfway through so that somebody right. else goes first. Right. So I like the like the fact that they did that. Um, you yeah, are now. That was Yeah, you are now living in Atlanta, and Atlanta is a very African-American place. Now, Mm -hmm. uh, white supremacy is global. You know, the slave trade didn't just happen in America. It happened all over places. Um, You know, and I am, you and me come from the same aesthetic. We come from the each one teach one aesthetic. We come from a pan-African way of looking at the world. Like, we we as as black people are part of a diaspora. And so I look at the brothers from the Caribbean as my my brothers and sisters and people in, 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 in Europe, I see it part of one black struggle. When I talk about a black agenda, I'm not just talking about black people in America, but right now there are mm-hmm. nativist groups, pro-Trump groups, groups of people who look to disparage African immigrants, Caribbean immigrants, because they are saying that Somehow, somehow they think that aligning with the right wing conservative anti-immigration talking points will help black Americans. I feel like there are real black people who are duped by this. And I feel like there are white supremacists who are insidious and trying to cause divisions from our community uh, in our community. Recently, um, I posted about this on IG and you commented how you hadn't really heard of any of these groups. But now that you're seeing that they're there, why is so dangerous and so toxic? So as a black person from the UK... Who, who understands and agrees that black people in America have a unique justice claim, um, just like black people in the UK have a unique justice claim. Um, how do you feel about groups that try their hardest to make sure that us as black people don't come together and have one black agenda for all black people? Well, I find it, I'm confused. It really confused me because just like you said, um, I had never heard of any of these um, groups until your, the, the particular post that you're speaking of mm-hmm. that I commented on. And it just, it made no sense to me. And, and I think I commented that, I expressed in my comment that it made no sense to me. And um, to give your viewers a little insight as to why um, a, a, a group that seems to want to draw a, a line in the sand amongst black people wouldn't make sense to me. Let me give you a, a, a little idea of where I come from and as, as far as the teachings. Now, you're, I already went through the whole thing of how West Indian people got to the UK or what have you, and that I'm of that, you know, I derive from that. So you already got that covered. But how my father raised me in the UK is, number one, I knew that my parents were, my entire family was from the island of Jamaica. Number two, my father made sure that I was clear that 
who the original, the Aboriginal people of Jamaica were, and mm-hmm. they derived from the Taino tribes. That's right. Um, and the Taino tribes are the same folks that uh, pe- peoples from Puerto Rico's derived, Puerto Rico and His- Hispaniola, which is of course now Dominican Republic and Haiti. These are the, this is the same origin tribe, the Taino tribe, and then when the Africans were brought to the West Indian Islands, being part of the British Empire and they wanted to man their sugarcane fields and and run all their different uh, um, economics in Jamaica to get their money. The, the the British brought the African slaves in, put them in all of these places, right? And then obviously they mix with uh, whatever of the natives were still left there. Okay, take all mm-hmm. of that into consideration. My father made sure that I knew all of this. He mm-hmm. explained all of this to me. He started explaining all of this to me, I think, from about 11, to be to be honest. He started that. And then in addition to all of that, being a black Brit, my father then also made sure that I knew what was going on amongst American blacks. So he went through the whole 60s with me. He went through um, the, the civil rights movement and struggle with me. He went through... Um, the different leaders that had come up and, you know, been stunted and um, the Black Panther Party movement. My father made sure, and it was a lot of literature. It was a lot of stuff to be reading mm-hmm. so young. And to be quite honest with you, I used to ask myself like, what? Because he used to make me read this stuff and then write like an mm-hmm. essay. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't front. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Jazz. Like I couldn't, I couldn't front and be like, yeah, I read it and blah, blah, blah. Like, no, my father made me write essays about what I had read because he wanted to be clear that I really understood and I really did read it. Autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, um, George Jackson's Solid Ad Brother. I was reading stuff that was having me gasp at like, oh my God, like this man was gagged and handcuffed and shackled in a courtroom and they wouldn't right. let him defend himself. Like, Mind blowing stuff to me as a, you know, under 15 reading this stuff. But I understand now in hindsight why he had me read it. So all of these things makes me who I am and brings me to your post on on your Instagram page and reading about this th- these organizations that exist that are trying to um, establish we you know, there's a there's a there's a line in the sand. We are this. So when reparations come, reparations are for us. Reparations are not for you. And it's like, in some ways, for one, I would never be trying to claim no reparations coming from uh, from the American government. To mm-hmm. the people, I wouldn't be trying to claim me personally. Personally, right. I wouldn't be trying to claim. I wouldn't be trying to claim any of that for the simple reason that the office that I need would I would need to visit is the office in the United Kingdom right? Mm-hmm. for their records, for their farms or where, and plantations, for the list of their slaves, there's, there's where mine would come from, mm-hmm. okay? So I'm, I'm clear on that. But there's still too many variables, and this is why I found it confusing. I tried mm-hmm. to read up on, on who they were. There's too many variables. Like, for instance, my youngest child is... Of me, of course, but her father is African American. Her father, his lineage is absolutely this country. The slaves mm-hmm. that were brought to this country, you know. Yeah. So then, what what do you what do you tell what do you tell a person like that that has grown up and has you know West Indian parents and then also African straight African American parents where their lineage goes back to the killing fields of mm-hmm. of this country. What, what do you what do you tell that person then? You know, and that's just one variable. And the other var- variable was what about when when bringing slaves from Africa then became abolished, but they were still transporting slaves from different places to America. Like and there were mm-hmm. slaves that were imported from the Caribbean to South Carolina. Right. They're they're West Indian. That's right. So it just, it was just so many variables. So it's like, I, I, I got it in one sense, but then I didn't get it in another sense. And the thing that just pretty much put a blanket over everything for me was I don't come from a separatist. I I, I don't come from separatist ideas. I, that ideology, it just, it doesn't feel organic. It doesn't feel 
it doesn't feel progressive to me, a separatist right. I- idea. It's not. Um, uh, it's not. I, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, now, for people watching, I can't overstate the impact that the native tr- tongues as a crew had on me uh, as a young man. I used to want to dress like Q-tip. I used to want to cut my hair and wear glasses <laughs> like pasta noose. Um, right. I used to shop in the village at Antique Boutique and Uniques. And I used to shop at House of Nubian and wear Doc Martin boots and Jabot jeans and Zodiacs and Paisley shirts and get like free South Africa buttons and peace oh buttons. God, that's, and that's so cute and, up and past. That is so cute up and past. Yeah, like, and like, like, uh, it's a black thing you want to understand. Book bags, like cloth book bags, like all of that. Like, I was really into it. The native tongues made me feel seen and welcome in hip hop, particularly the De La Soul video, Me, Myself, and I. Um, where they're like the nerds in the school and the hip hop, everybody's like these old school hip hop tropes and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're making fun of it, but also making fun of themselves. Can you tell me the definitive story of how you came to be involved in the Native Tongues crew? It starts from Dave Funk and Klein. Do you remember Dave Funk and Klein? Yes. As a fan. Yes. Okay. Dave Funk and Klein was like, he, he worked with, um, with Russell Simmons, um, but he, he, was definitely a hip hop ambassador. He would bring groups, artists from the from the United States to England. He brought over at one particular time True Mathematics, Queen Latifah, The Jungle Brothers, and Chill Rob G for a mm-hmm. string of shows around Europe. Um, I was a bubbling MC at the time, bubbling under. You know, people had heard of me in different neighborhoods or what have you, and uh, Funk and Klein. They went to a place in Camden Town called Dingwalls, Hole in the Wall, but definitely number the one, one of the number one hip-hop spots that we would go to. And so all of those groups performed there one night, and Funk and Klein met me, and he had heard of me through other people that he had spoken to in England and in London, and he introduced me to Queen Latifah, True Mathematics, Joe Rob G, and the Jungle Brothers. How old were you? And it, I was 16. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was 16 at the time. And Latifa and I, during that trip, I started dating Africa from the Jungle Brothers and I forged a serious sisterhood with Latifa at 16. Um, To the point where I had to get a Saturday job because I was on the phone with her a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Saturdays. Yeah, my mother was like, the phone bill is just too high because I was constantly on the phone with Latifa a lot. A lot. So I had to get a Saturday job in a shoe store to make up for how much I was spending from being on the phone with Latifa. Um, so when I when my career started to really get serious in England and I got signed to a record label in England, which was Chrysalis Records in England, and um, Africa had been uh, brought on to produce some of the music and he bought in some of the people that he works in like Juju and the Beat Nuts Shout to, to help nuts. with mm-hmm, to help with my music and then through Africa obviously I started getting introduced to everybody else and the like mindedness of everybody made it a no brainer where Pass and Cuta was like yo she should she should be on deck she should totally be on deck Mm. And it just, nobody sat me down and was like, oh, would you like to be a part of, you know, there was no, it was, it was a <laughs> sorority fraternity. You know, you would you like to be a part? This is what you have to do. Your initiation is this. Like, no, mm. none of that. It was just vibes. It was just vibes. That's all it was. It was like, she's dope. She's like-minded. It is what it is. And it yeah. was just, it was just that simple. And instantly my family grew by, you know, picked up a bunch of brothers <laughs> immediately, wow. you know, right. so Q-Tip, Q-Tip and I and Pass and I and Mason and Dove and all of us, it just immediately became the the brothers and sisters and the family. Uh, Q-Tip was talking about native tongues and he said hip hop praises individualism. And I think that's the main achievement of Native Tongues. It showed that people could really come together. Um, we also talked to Questlove and about Soul Quarians. And I think that a lot of people would love to know, like, how did it, how did these crews and collectives get together? Like, there was no text messages back in the day. So how did you guys <laughs> figure out question. 
Who? Okay, sorry. Smoke now, signals, now, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to pull the age card. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's fine. It's fine. You look. We look the it's same fine. age, so it's all good. Okay. All right. Jazz, it's fine. listen, Jazz. I know this is your first time. Your first time speaking to me, but like. You know, the, my brother right here will tell you the last person on earth that's going to shy away from hollering her age is Moni. <laughs> good to hear. That's how I'm going to be, too, if I look that good. Uh, <laughs> so how did you guys pull folks to get into certain cap- collaborations and projects back then? Um, beepers and pay phones. Mm. <laughs> code. You had a code. <laughs> Yeah, beepers and payphones. That was really, and where I lived, I lived in Brooklyn and I lived on a a, a dead end block called Westbury Court off Flatbush Avenue. And right across the street, there was the um, the Chinese food spot. Damn, I could go for some. Anyway, the Chinese food spot was right there. No Chinese food tastes the same like the hood Chinese food. Oh, yes. um, (laughs) Anyway, the the Chinese food spot was right there. And then there was a payphone. It was like my office. That was my office. The Chinese food store and the payphone in front of the Chinese food store. That was my office. So, and I had a beeper. So Mm -hmm. everybody had codes. So I knew when, whenever it came to studio time and and stuff like that, I knew Africa had his code. Q-tip had his code. And um, Poss, I didn't get summoned by Poss that much because Poss pretty much just left it up to if Dayla was doing something and they needed me to be there or, or I needed to be at the studio or what have you. Mm. And I wasn't there already because understand Native Tongues works like a commune for real. Nobody is necessarily at the studio during their own studio time. That's another mm. reason why it was easy to do stuff because nobody waited to be specifically summoned. It was, we got studio time and that's it. Every mm. and anybody could be there at any given time. Even if you don't have a session that day, specifically yourself, you could, ju- you could just be there, you know? And so we're all in there. We're all it's over tough. the floor, lying on the floor, on the couches. Somebody just ran out to get Egg Foo Young. You know what I'm saying? It was really a, a, a commune. But if in the event that somebody wasn't there that needed to be there, Pass. Q-Tip and Africa, the three heads of Native Tongue that all had their codes would beep whoever it is. We all had beepers and everybody had a payphone they could use somewhere <laughs> across the street, in the laundromat, wherever yeah. it was. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if you were still in your house, whatever it was, you know. So mm-hmm. I used to um, run across the street. I would get beeped. I'd run across the street and Africa would be like, oh, Dela has a session at such and such today. So. Just be there. And I'll be like, do I have to do anything? Not necessarily, but just be there. Okay. Right. And that's and that's what it was. But you talked about Chinese food. And since we all lived in New York, did you guys used to get the crinkle fries that came in the styrofoam and they already had the ketchup on top? Why doesn't anyone else make those? Because I don't know. I don't know. I used to that's, get that. You know what it, uh, that's what, that's, that's Chinese people who open restaurants in Chinese restaurants in black neighborhoods and quickly realize that black people in these neighborhoods are going to want chicken and fries. And so that's like, yes. a, that's a very sort of New York, specifically New York Chinese restaurant. When I used to travel the country and I used to go to Chinese restaurants, they used to have like P.F. Chang's and shit like that. I'm like, this ain't Chinese food. Yeah. I mean, where's right. this time from? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. And the, and, the, and the other thing is like, I used to get, shri- I used to get shrimp and lobster sauce in the, um, the, the container, the court container. Yeah. Right. And Same then container would have the iced tea. Yes. I got the quart <laughs> container with the iced tea. Yes. Yes. And I cannot. And it's like once I left, it was like, it's not the same. It's At not all. the same. Oh. It's not the yeah. same anywhere else. And I'm there's no, I've, ever since I left New York, I never found another restaurant named Great Wall. There was a Great Wall <laughs> in damn near every four blocks. <laughs> yes. In Brooklyn. Right. Great Wall. <laughs> Right. The menu had the numbers on it because so, they didn't know English. You'd be like, give me the number 12. Yes. yes. Give me number 12. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I miss that so much. I've never, it's never been the same anywhere else. But thank you for that sidebar. That was very refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Red Alert was very instrumental in the careers of Jungle Brothers, Tropical Quest, De La Soul. And without Red Alert, I mean, just beyond what he did with BD, BDP, Boogie Down Production, Kiss FM, People don't credit Red Alert, Red Alert enough, I think. But you were there. Can you tell us being there why Red Alert 
is so important and why people should be talking about Red Alert when they talk about hip hop history some more. What's really, and, it, and it's true, the, the, the one set of folks that I can absolutely say are completely clear on what Red Alert has done are the DJs, the important mm. DJs, the DJs that are familiar with breaking the days of breaking records. Yes. Those DJs. Those DJs absolutely understand and give full homage and credit to somebody as a red alert because that's what he did. That's what he was doing. And that is why he's responsible for so many people's careers, including mine, mm -hmm. as far as being broken in the United States. Because before I released any music out here, I had music that was sent here on import because I was released mm -hmm. as an artist in the UK before releasing any music here. So there was, there were the few odd 12 inches that were imported uh, to the United States. Uh, before I was actually released as an artist in the United States. But as far as breaking me full-fledged as an artist in this country, that would be Red Alert. Red Alert was the conduit for many an artist. Red mm. Alert was the one that played their records on a Friday night and a Saturday night and broke records. And he was so much of so much so this person that my management in England was managing Soul to Soul. And uh, the, when they first started and they were hot mm -hmm. in England and they were the best thing in England. But shout out to Jazzy B. The, shout out to Jazzy B. They had not broken the United States yet. Jazzy B gave me an acetate pressing of Back to Life. Tell them what an acetate is real quick for the people who don't know. Okay. Acetate <laughs> is like, it's like a dub plate. Jamaicans call it right, a dub right, plate. Right. right. And it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost like glass for real, mm. right? But it's, it's black thick. and it has the recording on it. It's very, mm. very thick. And um, it's, it's usually used for like the one-off purposes. Uh, we need to test, we need to press this up real quick. You mm. know, when like in dub plate in Jamaicans, when they have like one rhythm, six different version of one rhythm. Right. Right. right? With, with this one's on it, then that one's on it, then this one's on it. And, and they need it quick so they can battle each other. The quickness of getting the recording onto something so you can play it, acetate. That was the method in which they got that done. Right. And um, so an acetate pressing, if you sit on that, it's a wrap. It's, it's like glass. Right. right. He gave me that. I got on a Virgin Atlantic flight with an acetate pressing of Back to Life to give to Red Alert. I had it on my body like this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I sat on the plane with the acetate on my body like this. Are you telling us that you broke back to life in New York City on I, Red Alert? I gave it to Red. <laughs> I gave it to Red. I was so nervous because if anything happened to this, it, it the whole plan would fail. And so I got off the plane and I went straight to Harlem. I went straight uptown to Red's house to give him this acetate pressing of back to life with the long extended acapella right. with Karen. Shout, shout out to Karen Wheeler. That's such okay. a powerful group of people. Right? And so yeah. I gave it to Red. Red blew everybody's minds with that thing. How long is the acapella I remember. part of that song? Right. Ooh, Mary, Mary did it over again and they used it in the belly thing. But like, exactly. before, I mean, I, the impact of that record at the time, I mean, I was like in junior high school, I believe. And it's just like, man, I remember that, that record hit. That record hit that different. That's how Red got it. That right. that's how Red got it. Well, because thank you, man. I walked I walked with it like <laughs> this onto a plane, sat on it for eight hours like this, got off the plane, got in a uh, cab like this, mm -hmm. like it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I thought I looked ridiculous, but it was it was that important. And Red broke that. It, Red broke that joint that Friday right. night. Red broke that joint. Now another reason why Red Alert is so important in hip hop and the impact that he had is that. Chris Lighty, a.k.a. Baby Chris Lighty, started out with the Violator crew taking care of and making sure Red Alert was good in these streets. The Violator crew turned into Violator Management, one of the most successful management companies hip-hop has ever seen. Chris Lighty is one of the most successful entrepreneurs hip-hop has ever seen. Rest in peace to Chris Lighty and shout out to the Lighty family. But Chris Lighty started out helping Red Alert out and then being road manager for Jungle Brothers, which I feel like he started to really learn his industry skills. For people who love hip hop, but don't fully understand the importance 
of Chris Lighty and the culture. Can you tell us a little bit about Chris Lighty? First of all, Violate, it wasn't something that was uh, developed in a corporate room or setting because it's like a lot of people know um, baby Chris, Chris Lighty, rest his soul, um, huge corporate mogul right. figure, you know what I'm saying? Which he absolutely is. And, but he comes from straight up muscle. Mm-hmm. Chris Lighty and the Violators, was a, it was a group of guys. The Violators was a group of guys that were muscle. They were muscle. They were security, Red Alerts folks, Red Alerts family. And Red then set them onto his groups mm-hmm. that be, were his groups. J- uh, Jungle Brothers were of the Red Alert family, one of the groups under the Red Alert family. Mike G of the Jungle Brothers being Red Alert's nephew. Mm-hmm. So that's one of his groups. Then the rest of the Native Tongues fell right in line under Red Alert. You know, Mr. Mm-hmm. Magic had the Juice Crew, uh, you know, on on, on right. WBLS. Red Alert was on Kiss FM. He had uh, the, the Native Tongue family, right? And he mm-hmm. had BDP. So coming from the Bronx also, Chris, um, the, Chris Ali, um, like all of the violators would be our security, and and Redwood Ma- and then they became our road man. Chris Lighty be- stepped up and became road manager for everybody. I remember being an excited little teenager um, under this umbrella of oh my gosh, like I'm with all <laughs> these guys. They're my like <laughs> brothers, and we're going to a club tonight. I'm not even old enough to really be in here, but oh because Lord. I'm performing, this is so cool. And we and Chris puts us all in this little boxy dressing room, and he's like, "Stay here. Nobody poke their head out. Don't walk around a club." Don't go nowhere, just stay in here. I'm like, okay, because we're going to get to perform in a minute anyway. We wait like 15, 20 minutes. Chris comes back. She's like, all right, everybody out. Out. Are we going onto the stage? I'm excited, you know? I'm yeah. brand new in America. This is really exciting. And um, Chris is like, no, we're leaving. And I'm like, but we just got here. Moni, that way. Everybody's going that way. Mm-hmm. Go that way, right? Money wasn't right. Chris would walk us in take us to the dressing room, go talk to whoever he needed to talk to. Money wasn't right. Chris was like, everybody get out now, out. Right. Nobody's doing Mm. nothing in here today. Nobody's coughing on a mic. Nobody's doing anything. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And that was Chris. And and that's the beginning days of who Chris was as a meticulous businessman Mm -hmm. in this music, in this music industry that went on to marketing and handled everything with the same ethics. He handled everything with the same ethical code as he did when we walked into a, when we were at the bottom of the totem pole, just walking into a club to get some cash to do a show. The same ethical, uh, uh, strong-minded business. It's business. You don't have the Mm -hmm. money right. Nobody's performing. We out. You know what I'm saying? And this transcended right. into his entire right. empire, into his entire empire. Um, now, in that era, you put out this debut album, Down to Earth, uh, Money in the Middle. Huge, huge record from this. That record is ubiquitous. It's a ubiquitous reference in hip hop. Biggie Smalls and other rappers, but most notably Biggie Smalls rapped about on what and what remix was that? Uh, Make you feel good like Tony, Tony, Tony. Put it in the middle like Money. Um, only you, the one twelve. Only one twelve, one twelve mm-hmm. remix, right? Now one we were hanging out. Songs. You and I were hanging out with IDK, who was a brilliant younger artist, and uh, you know he was like, um, he was like, so what do you do, <laughs> right? And it was like I rap, you know, <laughs> I rap a little bit. He's like, oh okay. I'm like, that's Moni Love, and he's like, wait, wait, Moni in the middle, Moni Love, and so, <laughs> um, how often do people come up to you and know you more from the references? To the record, than to than a than a from the actual record. All the time, mm. that's that is how they align me with who I am, like mm. that, with those references. And there's so many of them. There's, there's so, so many. There's of a lot. Them. Yeah, and that's how a lot of people will be like, "That's you." Wait, back that thing up. That's you. Put the right. piece in the middle, <laughs> like Moni. That's you. Right. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm, the, you know, even. <laughs> As recent as um, Kanye, you mm-hmm. know, Kanye did it. And the, you know what's really funny? The way how Kanye did it was like, thank you, I think. Because um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was odd. But he was so, <laughs> he was so geeked with the fact mm-hmm. that he did that reference. 
I saw him at Brooklyn Bodega Festival. Chris was still with us. Baby Chris mm. was still with us. And um, baby Chris and I were talking backstage. Q-Tip performed that year. And that's when Q-Tip brought Buster up on stage with him. And then he brought me up on stage with him to perform like Q-Tip and Friends. And Kanye mm. was um, b- backstage also. And he ran up to me. All of this is to do with the whole Money in the Middle references that you were mentioning. And he had just name dropped me. I don't remember the name of the song right now. And I'm old. I'm 50. You have to give me a break. <laughs> and um, he he ran up to me. He was like, Moni, Moni, I just mentioned your name in a song. I just mentioned your name. Uh-huh. And I was like, really? He was so geeked by it. And he was like, did you hear it yet? And I was like, no, I didn't hear it yet. And he was like, you got to hear it. So he told me the name of the song. And then when I listened to it, it was, it was quite raunchy. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> And it, he was, it just cracked me up how excited he was about the fact that he did this to the point where he told me to go back and listen to it like homework. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> and, then when I, and, then, and then when I did listen to it and I was like, this is kind of, this is kind of raunchy. Like I could really take this wrong. I just, I, I honestly didn't take offense to it because of the mm. fact that I have the prerequisite episode of him running up to me at the Brooklyn Bodega right excited like a little kid in a candy shop that he had said this and because of that when I actually heard it I didn't get offended I just was like oh my god you're you're Kanye you are just Kanye right (laughs) Kanye sit down stop trying to run for president Uh, anyway but this show is not about Kanye um (laughs) message (laughs) um ladies first uh for me was to really, I mean, there were other records and other uh, female women artists uh, that were out before Ladies First. You know, you had Shah Rock and Shantae and, and Light and, and who pay, really paved the way. But I think Ladies First right. was the first real ownership of feminism, of womanism in hip hop in, in a major way. And what is special about it is whether or not you love women, you can't front on how dope that record is. So... Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about what the intention of that record was and how it got made? Honestly, I'm going to give it to Latifah and say that I think she had more cognizant intentions for that Mm -hmm. song than I did. I just wanted to rhyme and I just wanted to shit on every dude. Excuse me. Are we allowed to Mm -hmm. say that? Yes, you can say whatever you want. Okay, you I can just shit, on every, shit on every dude. Like not, every not as far dude. as my not as far as my, not as far as my content. As far as my flow and my delivery, like I wanted to strike fear in the hearts of men in hip hop. Mm-hmm. Mm. As far as what I sounded like on the mic, that was my goal at all times. So mm. Latifa, I think, really had a, 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 a cognizant. She was in a mind state where she specifically wanted to do an anthem. She wanted it to be a strong women's anthem. I didn't realize. Mm. I just was like, this is this is a dope beat. This is a dope beat. Mm-hmm, Yo, right. Mark gave us a dope beat. And, you know, we were in power playing Queens in the studio recording it. And she was in one corner and I was in another corner. We just kept writing like four bars at a time and then exchanging notes. Like, listen to this. You listen to this. How that sound? How that sound? Oh, that's dope. All right, go back to our respective corners. Write four more bars. Come back. Exchange those. We just kept doing mm. that. The whole studio session was a vibe. It was so dope. And mm. it was the first time that it was just us. It was just two women. Of course, you know, some of the Flavor Unit was there. You know what I'm saying? Ramsey and, and like him, Shabazz, Apache, God rest his soul, you know, in our right. session. But that was the first session that was commanded by women because we're always in the native tongue sessions and it's pass at the board and cue to put the board and this one and that one. This time it was Latifa and I and engineers. Mm. You know what I mean? So it was a it the whole studio session was super super powerful. Latifa clearly knew that she wanted to do an anthem. Me, I was I was just there for the bars. I'm here for the bars. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Shit that, on was, that was yeah. that was my vibe. That was uh, one of my mom's favorite songs. She actually named my my little sister's middle name is Latifa because of Queen Latifa. Wow, but, I never knew um, that. That's really dope. oh yeah. Yeah, that's her Makes middle name. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, in that song, you guys really shine a light on the lives and the struggles of black women. Um, we've carried so much weight. We've been ignored and we complain so little. What's going on today in this movement? Do you feel like people are finally starting to listen to us? Do you feel like this is our chance to finally get the appreciation that we deserve? I think it's definitely a, a, a chance for us 
to hone in and, and, and allow people that have not been paying attention to pay attention. I certainly feel like that. Um, the attention that we are getting, even within, even within the injustices that are happening right now, I don't, I don't feel like they're paying attention to the injustices on women enough. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I'll agree. just right. go ahead. I'll, I'll just go ahead and say that. So I do think that it is our time to uh, resurge every bit of an ingredient that comes from ladies first and anything even slightly remotely related to that vibe, a book, a poem, uh, a, you know, a, a, an activist, any, any of these things that are even slightly related to that vibe is now is definitely the time to, to, to push that up front and demand more attention uh, uh, of, the, of the fine detail of the black woman's struggle in this country. Now is definitely time to, to, to catapult that to the highest plateau for mm-hmm. the world to understand that and give it more thought and give it more empathy and give it more attention and do something about it. Not just, not just, not just talk about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Definitely the time. It's a perfect time right now. Yeah. I've challenged myself and I've challenged the staff here at people's party <clears throat> because hip hop is so testosterone driven and so male ego driven, so male energy driven that um, our default is to always uplift the dudes and 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 it's very easy for me to talk to men. And um, you know, uh we have to actively be pro women on the show. And I don't feel like we've had enough women on the show. And it's it's been a struggle. And I, I I appreciate you and the other women who come on the show for coming on the show because it gives us an opportunity to have these these type of discussions. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's not just the non quote unquote non woke people who gotta do better. It's also the quote unquote woke people who got to do better, you know? And so I appreciate you and I appreciate you, Jasmine, for helping me to be able to, to do this better um, as a man. Oh, for, oh, um, for sure. For sure. I'm, I'm glad you touch on this type of stuff. Now, you know, since, since we're all here, you know, I'm mm-hmm. glad that you guys touch on this type of stuff because there's a lot that's changed, but there's a lot that hasn't. Because when I, mm-hmm. when, when I was, com- when I was coming up, you know, I was cute and everybody wanted to holler at me and everybody wanted to talk to me. And it was like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. I want to eat your food. Do you understand? Like, <laughs> yes. Like I want, I want to rhyme you under a table. Like I understand that like coming from England, I, I have, you know, big daddy cane on my wall and this one on my wall and that one on my wall. And it's like, I, I, I love y'all, but the competitive spirit in me, I want to eat your food. I want yes. you to respect my bars respect what I'm mm-hmm. saying, respect my wordplay, respect my cadence, respect my flow, respect all of that. You know what I'm saying? So I did, I deliberately did things to myself to take away from what, what somebody could look at. I cut all mm-hmm. my hair off. That's why I had a high top fade. I had yeah. hair down to my back. I took, cut all that shit off. No, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to get rid of the hair. We're going to put You're talking some, about that fade, part. that fade you had on the, uh, doing our own thing cover where you was playing that little fake horn? Yeah. I had parts. I had parts right, and designs parts. all in that in the back. Mm-hmm. Yep. I had cuts in my eyebrows trying to wild out. I had yep. um I had gold teeth and all kinds yep. of stuff. It, it, because it was I did all these things to it. I banded myself down. I had ba- I banded myself like I banded jazz. Mm. I banded down the mm. boobies jazz. Mm. Well, okay. I didn't have to do that, but I definitely I did all know that. where you're coming from. Because <laughs> when I um when I started doing stand up, that was an issue for me too. Like, oh, you're just cute, you're just sexy, and I started like dressing like in full stud attire for like two years on on stage or whatever, just so I can get that respect and people just not look at me as like oh adorable person I want to smash. Exactly, and it took a minute. It took a minute for me because I was you know I was brand new and I was. British and, you know, a black girl from the UK thrusted into this hip hop world. It was different for a lot of the guys that were, that were leading at the time. So it was like, oh yeah, she cute. She can rhyme, you know, let me holler at her. So it took a minute to get everybody to take me seriously. It didn't take dumb long, but it did take a minute for everybody to take me seriously. And then once they did, I have lifelong friendships with a lot of these guys now, lifelong friendships. With a lot, and now, and we wind up on the same. We wind up on the same um, bookings a lot now Mm -hmm. with a lot of the show Mm -hmm. bookings and stuff that we do. You know what I'm saying? But I said that to say 
that a lot has changed, but a lot hasn't changed because there's still a, there is still a fight yeah. the women have to go through now because, mm-hmm. and especially when, especially once Salt and Pepper's original blueprint com- transcended and took complete shape and, and, and morphed even bigger than what it was as far as being tongue in cheek and in touch mm-hmm. with your, with, you know, the whole sexual revolution within hip hop where women are more in control of their sexuality and things of this nature. So it's, it's a salt and pepper blueprint, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That has gone on to, to the Trinas and the, and the, and the little Kims and the Foxy Browns and, um, the Nicki Minaj's and the Cardi B's and, mm-hmm. and, and the Megan the Stallions, you know what I'm saying? This is, this is all salt and pepper blueprint, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's still a fight amongst women because not every woman is not every woman are the women that I mentioned. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And it's, and it's almost like the men in, in, in the industry and, and, and they've taken a hold of that blueprint to the point where it's like, okay, this is it. As, when we think of women in hip hop, this is it. And that's all that it is. And it's like, no, because it's like, you know, Earlier on, there was that with the salt and pepper, which is where this comes from. But there was also Latifah. There was also light. There was also me. You know what I'm saying? So things have changed, but they haven't changed. It's like there's always a one dimensional pigeon box Mm -hmm. allotted for women. And it's like, no, that's not that's that's not fair. Allow us to have our versatility. Embrace it all. You know what I'm saying? So it's still a fight. There's still a fight there. Word up. Word up. Um, one of the greatest women to ever grace our lives and our stages and our ears and our eyes is the great Whitney Houston, who we lost a few years ago. You had the pleasure of working with Whitney Houston on My Name Is Not Susan. Um, how did you link up with Whitney Houston and what was that like? When Whitney puts the bat signal out for you to do something with her, <laughs> you, you do it. Okay. Right. She sent um, from the album I'm Your Baby Tonight. And uh, the, ne- the, ne- the song on it, My Name Is Not Susan, and the remix that was done. Uh, I forgot the name of the guy that did the, did the, did the, uh, the remix. Track originally, of course, pr- produced by uh, Babyface. But she specifically sent a telegram. Telegram. I said telegram. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she sent you a telegram, a singing, she, a singing telegram. A singing telegram. On the Pony Express. She sent, <laughs> she sent a telegram that specifically asked for me to rhyme on the song. Mm -hmm. And there was never any no about it. I I was, of course. Mm -hmm. So I got the music and I wrote the rhyme and um, then I had to do the video with her. So I had to go to the, to the video shoot and the whole time the video, I had just had a brand new baby. Okay. Jazz. I just had a brand new baby. My baby was like three months or something like that. And um, so the whole video shoot, Whitney was, it was like school and class was in session. She was quizzing me about having a baby, the pregnancy process. She was quizzing me about all of this and I couldn't understand why. Mm-hmm. But she had she had me. I did not have a dressing room someplace else. She had me on her hip the entire day, specifically because she wanted to go through everything with me as far as being pregnant, the process, blah, 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 childbirth, <laughs> everything. So I'm like, and she's skinny as a rail. I'm like, why is she asking me all, all, all of this? She wasn't pregnant, nowhere near pregnant. But I guess maybe she was in a mindset where she wanted to start a family because it wasn't. We mm-hmm. became fast friends. Cut a long story short, we became fast friends, and from there it was like I was constantly at the at the Houston compound in New Jersey for barbecues and different events and blah blah blah. And um, you know, I was at the. Not long after that, it came out that her and Bobby were together and that they were getting married. So I was at the wedding, and you know, and then I was at her baby shower, and then. I remember her baby shower, she brought it up. She was like, see, she was like, you didn't know why I made sure I had you around. She was like, I was, I was getting all my, she was like, I was getting all my homework in. She was like, I wasn't playing. Right. She was like, I was, she was like, I kept you close because I needed to get all my homework in. And da, 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 da. But she was like, but nobody knew that I was serious about who I was going to marry and serious about starting mm-hmm. a family. And, but mm-hmm. she, she clearly was, was all of this in her head. 
You know what I mean? So mm. it was a really good experience. I was scared. I didn't know what to ex expect. She was this grand diva, you know, superstar. And you never know what to expect with people. And a lot of times when you meet folks that you really dig or what have you, it can be disappointing. Not a lot, but mm -hmm. sometimes. And it was just so beautiful and refreshing that she was not disappointing. And she actually became, you know, one of my coolest coolest friends and she hood she was so That's hood right. <laughs> like from jersey right yeah she was like definitely a jersey girl she was really she was so hood and it's like i'm thinking i'm hip-hop and i'm more you know rough around <laughs> the edges than her, than her but you know my my british jamaican strict upbringing was mm -hmm. no match for whitney's raw uh, emotion and just the right. way she was just raw and flat out in your face forefront about everything. God rest the soul. One of the one of the right best on. people I've ever met. Yes, rest in peace. Rest uh, in peace seeing ladies. as you were already uh, talking about motherhood, um, you're a mother for I'm expecting my first baby girl in less than seven weeks. Um, being in this industry and, you know, having children and still being able to stay relevant and still going and doing songs with Whitney Houston, like anything that you can share with myself and any other mothers that are in the entertainment industry right now? Absolutely. The one thing that is undeniable about, um, about a woman, a woman is just her multifaceted dynamic. Like we can do everything. And when I say everything, I really do mean everything like our level of multitasking is absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal and um stay on your a game with everything never let not one piece of what you're doing that you're passionate about never let one part of it rest i won't even say mm -hmm. slack i'll say rest don't let it rest you know what i'm saying give each and every part of what you're passionate about the same amount of drive and attention even through your um your pregnancy you know it's funny because i remember remember the reveal that not well you know i know everybody does this reveal thing now which we never used to do back in the days but the reveal i'm talking mm -hmm. about is when cardi b <laughs> cardi b oh, yeah. did her own reveal on mm -hmm. was it the tonight show mhm mm what okay and I remember yes, I posted, I posted that. I posted a clip of that on my Instagram and underneath it, I, and then after I posted that, I posted mine. I did exactly the same thing like 20 something years ago on Showtime at the Apollo. I was mm. damn near ready to pop with my first child who's 29 now. And I got on Showtime at the Apollo and I did Moni in the Middle. And at the end of Moni in the Middle, I opened my jacket. So Beyonce wasn't first, Cardi wasn't first. You know what I'm saying? I, I did that. And I did, and which is why it resonated with me when Cardi did it. And it resonated mm -hmm. with me when Beyonce did it is because I felt them. I felt their energy. Mm. And the reason why I did it, I started rubbing my stomach. I started saying Moni in the middle, really in the middle, rubbing my stomach. All of the <laughs> Apollo went, com all of the Apollo went completely nuts. They all stood up. They were screaming. It was a hilarious moment. Like, and it's on YouTube, right? I and watch that. the reason, Me too. the reason why, the reason why I did that was because in not so many words, the people around me, as far as the executives were basically on some abortion type time. Nobody mm -hmm. actually said that to me, but they were like, you know, I announced that I was pregnant when I was, when I was three months in and they were like, okay, well, what are you going to do? What is there to do? I just told so wait, you I'm record, three months record in. Record industry people were like that? Right. Record executives? That's crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, what are you going to do? What you mean, what am I going to do? I just told you I'm three months in. There is nothing to do. There's, there's, a, there's nothing a child to do. coming. Mm -hmm. So the fact mm. that you're even asking me what I'm going to do And they're not intimate with you like that too as well. Like No, no. Right, These are people like the in the art department and A&R departments and mm. and- you know what I'm saying? Like, what am I going to do? I just said I'm three months pregnant. It means there's a child coming in six months. Like, what you mm -hmm. mean? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it was that just... Was it was disrespectful for them to ask you that. Yeah. And so that was my way of basically saying... And I didn't miss a beat. I was on tour my whole pregnancy. I was on a triple threat tour with Key Sweat, Johnny Gale, and BBD. Mm. All the way up until I was like seven and a half months. I did not miss a beat. I was in the studio constantly. You know what I'm saying? Which is why I get Cardi. 
I get her. I get Beyonce. I get these women. You know what mm. I mean? Because I do, you know, you don't, I'm not stopping what I'm doing. This is what I do. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? Faith, Faith Evans, same thing. Me and Fa- I remember being in the studio and me and Faith both had babies on our hips oh. in studio sessions. <laughs> right. I love Faith. Um, you now, know what I'm saying? I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, just your trajectory in radio. Um, in 2006, in Philadelphia, uh, you and Young Jeezy got into a heated argument over hip hop, whether or not hip hop was dead. And you were essentially agreeing with Nas and saying that you felt like hip hop is dead. And Jeezy left the studio. Um, right after that, uh, contract negotiations stalled and you were no longer a part of this show. How do you feel about that looking back and who is making music right now that feels connected to the hip hop and rap traditions that you uh, wanted to keep alive? Oh, that's such a that's a huge question. Um, mm. Break it down and let me answer it a bit at a time. Okay, because I'm sorry, there's a lot of questions. Um, just talk. Okay, is it true that that show that you had in Philly ended because of this argument with Jeezy? Okay. No, I did not mm-hmm. uh, leave the radio station or get let go from the radio station or get mm-hmm. fired from the radio station um, in Philly because of uh, an argument between Young Jeezy and myself. People don't know what goes on behind the scenes in radio. And I was already six months past a deadline to sign a renegotiated contract to continue Mm. working at that station. So the day Mm. that Jeezy came to the station for that interview was was the station's last day that they were giving me to make a decision about this renegotiated, about the renegotiation. Was I going to stay there? And we had a dispute about, the the dispute wasn't about money, oddly enough. They agreed to uh, what my lawyer presented was a feasible number for me to stay. They agreed to that. The part that we weren't in agreement on was the language that stated anything that I do outside of that radio show that involved my face, my namesake, my caricature, my voice, whatever, I would have to seek permission from the Mm. radio station and the broadcasting company in order to do that. So if I wanted to write my book... um, I'd have to seek permission from the radio station. If I wanted to do a voiceover for a cartoon, I would have to seek permission. And, and, and it's like, it just didn't sit right with me because I was like, I named myself Moni Love when I was 13 years old in London, in South London, England. Mm. Mm-hmm. Hip hop, what well, hip hop wasn't even on the radio seven days a week mm-hmm. back then. Like hip hop wasn't on the radio at all back then, but here we are now. And you're, trying to suggest that I'm going to be in a place where I have to come and seek permission for you from you to do things that are my own branding, my mm-hmm. own likeness, my own caricature, my own voice. Right. And it just didn't sit right with me. So my lawyer was trying to get them to come to a, a, a mutual place of agreement that would say, you know, we will, you will always be up to speed. We will always keep you in the loop of whatever Moni is doing. And, Mm. you know, we will always make sure that she's not involved in anything that is going to be, um, looked upon as, um, I forgot the word disparagingly, uh, uh, as far as the radio station be looked at bad, you know? And Mm. so he was, we were trying to get the language like that. And they wouldn't agree to it. So the day Jeezy came in to be interviewed was that last day that as soon as I got off the air, I had to go into the office and have that meeting. Like, we're not changing our language. It is what it is. Are you going to sign this or not? And that's what happened. And that's what they said. And I said, oh, not going to sign it. All right. And the other part of it, and I want to qualify the other part of it, ask you about who do you feel like is keeping hip hop alive right now, but I want to tailor it a little bit uh, and bring it back to the conversation we had about female MCs and which female MCs or women MCs is, is I'm, I'm trying to get out of saying female MCs cause I don't call, <laughs> I don't call women females, but for some, for some reason we talk about MCs, we say female MCs. Okay. So we can say what, 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 what MCs amongst the sisters. There we go. There we go. That you're feeling right now. Rap. Rap. I mean, there's, Rap, there's, yep. there's more, there, there's, there's more than her, but I say her because everybody will, will pretty, cause you know, it irks me that there are so many women that are so awesome that are not getting the light that they should be getting. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it it frustrates me, you know, because there's, there's, I don't even have to explain to you how I feel about Jean Grey. Jean Grey makes me rip out my shirt. Oh, man. Me too. <laughs> Jean Grey, <laughs> I, I don't, there's, there's not many MCs that I, I think are, that I, that I, that make me be like, I don't know if I could fuck with them. I, I can name mm. them on one hand. Gene is in and, that group. I'm not going to tell you who else, but Gene is in that group. <laughs> and you can understand, you can understand me because earlier in this conversation, I said to you how I felt about striking fear in the hearts of men mm. on this microphone. I explained mm. that to you. This is why Jean Grey is a beast and a monster. <clears throat> and she's just Godzilla to me because she mm. does that. I've been around men's circles and I'm not going to name y'all because y'all going to be real salty with me. <laughs> so I, I won't name you, but I've been around men that second guess themselves when it comes to Jean Grey. That's right. So she, she, that's why I say she makes me rip my shirt off. Like she puts me, because when I hear music, I don't just vibe off music. I give you raw emotion to music. So when I hear something that's going to make me wild out like Jean does, that's just so lyrically intricate. She's a mathematician with that shit. No okay? doubt. Okay? Um, she makes me rip out my shirt. But it, it annoys me that it's, it's like a selective core group of people that really mm-hmm. understand who a Jean Grey is and how important she is. It ir- That irks me. You know? Mm-hmm. Um. I would say as far as the forefront that, 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 you know, a lot of the, I guess, hippie trendy, you know, I started listening to hip hop two weeks ago. People would know. <laughs> I would, I would say you would know a rap, you know, who Rhapsody is, you know what I'm saying? So for me, she's holding, she's holding that down and, and I need her there to do that, to allow everybody to understand that there are a fleet of women that are dissecting a beat, dissecting the bars and and putting it back together again and making it all sound like mm-hmm. making it all make sense. There are those women out there and Rhapsody is a, a, a beaconing uh, uh, power allowing people to understand that that element of hip hop amongst women does exist because variety is not something that's evenly tallied right now. Mm-hmm. It's like It's like we're all we're all part of the sexual revolution or we're not. And you don't really know of them that much. And so therefore Rhapsody is the one is, is one woman that I would say is allowing everybody to at least explore the idea that there are women out there that are of a different variety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was shocked on the, um, I was watching the BET awards and she wasn't up for best hip hop woman. And I was like, how did they leave her out of the conversation? Because how they're watching going the BET with Awards. The, because, because they're going <laughs> with the what, We have to support BET Awards. <laughs> Why do we have to support the BET Awards? Because it's our own thing. And I'd much rather us put in effort it's our own and thing. money. Who owns, who owns to, BET? Okay, a white person. Viacom but, owns. That's, that's but, not but, no, I get what Jazz okay, is saying. I get it's what It's a Jazz white person saying, that though. owns it, but <laughs> it celebrates black culture. And the virtual <laughs> BT Awards actually was a great celebration of black culture. And I feel like that we need to put money into awards such as BET instead of having to go on strike every year because Grammys and Oscars don't fuck with us. So that's why I watched the BT Awards, even though they are owned by Viacom. And I was upset. <laughs> That they did not have Rhapsody on there. But see, here's the well, thing, Jazz. They, they, the reason why they don't have Rhapsody on there is because they are owned by, by Viacom. And I am, I am, I am, I am, I am a part of the artist tribe. So I support artists. Like if I watch the BET Awards, it's clear with me. I'm watching it because I want to support the artist. But I watch mm-hmm. it with the knowledge that we don't own that. And so if we want to see mm-hmm. somebody like Jean Grey or Rhapsody get awards, then we need to cut BET out the, out the equation. We need to come with our own hip hop culture awards that come from the culture. You know what I'm saying? But, um, but yeah, I mean, um, they did, so they had a, so I, I didn't hear you correctly. You're saying that there was a, a, a category for women rappers this year and Rhapsody mm-hmm. wasn't in it? Rhapsody was not on it. They had Meg the Stallion. They had Doja Cat with the K, KK. They had um Wait, wait, Cardi do, do, B, what, 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 what? What'd you say? Megan I heard Fox. that. No, that was fly. That was fly. That was fly. If I could kiss you, I would kiss you. That was fly. Not Megan okay, Fox. Meg the Stallion. They had Meg the Stallion. 
and they had Lizzo, but no Rhapsody. And I feel right. like Lizzo's more pop than rap anyway. Yeah, Lizzo can rap because uh, she can out-rap a lot of dudes. But you're right, her, she, she makes more pop music. But I got to say this, man, and I'm so happy we have Moni here. Um, none of these people would exist without artists like Moni Love. So I'm glad that you're here. And when you say that you um, can't contain your joy and can't contain your excitement when you hear something uh, that you like, that speaks for, to the culture. That's real because I just did a concert with you in Yellow Springs and we it wasn't a concert because we were just sort of doing karaoke on stage. Like we just didn't, we as artists, we missed the stage so much that when the concert was over, we just started singing songs we liked. And uh, Moni was up there beatboxing and doing the bass line for Paid in Full. And then when DJ Trauma played Nirvana, Moni started the slam dance in the mosh pit on stage. And so I just want to say that I really, really, truly appreciate and I am inspired by how passionate you are about not just hip hop, but music. Thank you so much, Moni Love, for being on the People's Party. We love you. Thank you. Each, each and every time, Thank I love you, you like so cook, much. love you like cook food. I want to get the labor stories too, so please, I, I make sure you think about me after you're done. I want to get the labor stories. Yes, I followed you on Instagram. I'm gonna slide into your DMs, so make sure you <laughs> give me a follow back because we're gonna talk about Absolutely. this breathing. Absolutely. Thank you. People's party <laughs> is happy to have Moni Love. Peace and love, y'all.